Uh, my name is Valentin. I work at JetBrains, uh, the company that brought IntelliJ ID, ReSharp, uh, RubyMine, TeamCity, and uh, many other tools. Uh, today, I would like to uh, tell you about a new project we started in the uh, RubyMine team. Uh, we are just only in the beginning and uh, we have a, only a fragile prototype. However, I like uh, the direction we are moving towards and I would like to share it with you. Uh, before we start, I'll state the roadmap for this session. Uh, we'll begin with a, a review of the code verification means in the Ruby world and the problems they face. Uh, not all the problems may be solved properly and uh, are being fought from different angles, producing some uh, TDD is dead and sick of Ruby reactions. Uh, then we'll look at slightly different approach for the code analysis, which combines uh, both program running and static analysis. And, uh, well, I can't say it changed lives, uh, nor it will make your programs bugless. Probably you'll need to wait for a Skynet for that. However, it may change uh, the game from some code smells detection, syntax-based, to a better type safety in Ruby. And uh, in the end, we'll also see what role does Ruby community play in this project. So let's start uh, with the tools we use. A major part of the program's success is the toolkit they have. So starting from code repos, CI servers, documentation, operation systems, programming languages, laptop manufacturers. Somewhere in the middle of that list, there may be some code analysis tools you're using. You may not use them as some teams don't use, for example, uh, code review tools. Uh, but it's clear though uh, that as with every other tool, it may save your bacon once to be repaid. Uh, so what is code analysis used for? Uh, it may find severe errors and uh, b before they come to production and affect your users. Uh, it may also suggest using the same code style uh, your company uses before your colleagues tell you about that. Uh, it may tell that your code won't work before you run the tests, if there are any tests for what you're writing about. And uh, in the end, it may help you write more concise and more beautiful code, uh, coping with the programming laziness uh, with some automatic refactorings and alike. So uh, do we have such kind of tool for Ruby? Uh, I will not advertise RubyMine here. Uh, we have a really well-known example. Uh, how many of you use RubyCup? Well, almost everybody, yeah, that's what I thought. So, uh, yeah, RubyCup is probably the most recognized linter for Ruby. Uh, it has a good number of community-influenced influ inspections called COPs. It has a plugin system which allows to enforce some team-wise guidelines uh, and check them. However, uh, it's barely a full-fledged static analysis tool. Uh, it's more of a guideline enforcer. It will find code smells which may lead to bugs, but not always it finds the bugs that, which already incubated in your code. So uh, look at this short snippet. Uh, Rubicop, uh, to the bottom you see the output of Rubicop, and it bothers about spacing in your code, but it doesn't see a real bug. On the last uh, line, uh, X doesn't, uh, has the type of hash and it doesn't have a down case method. So this code actually fails. Uh, now let's look at the tool of slightly different specialization. And uh, yeah, <laughs> RubyMine here it is. Uh, RubyMine focuses more on bugs detection rather than code style consistency, although it has some power on that field too. In the case of that particular code snippet, uh, RubyMine understands that X has the type of hash and so it can send the down case method. In statically typed languages, uh, if you used uh, any IDs for them, such an error would be a crimson stain in the editor, but here RubyMine uh, is kind of uncertain about that. Why so? Uh, Ruby dynamic nature allows for creating really beautiful and concise domain-specific languages, uh, however, it has a price. They are really difficult to analyze. 
So look at this example from the diaspora social network, which I used to challenge our ID. Uh, this build pulse method uh, returns different types depending on the value of a symbol you pass it as the first parameter. So uh, actually, this problem is not something that is fixable by a statically typed languages. Uh, coping with such situations uh, needs some data flow analysis, and uh, I'm not sure we have a a tool today which copes this, all, all of this. But let's dream about a perfect static analysis tool we would like to have. How could it cope with all these cases? How can it guess, for example, that your code instantiates some classes which are defined in your YAML files? Well, it just can't. But how do we uh, solve these problems as a programmers, as people? Beware of bugs in the above code. I have only proved them, correct? Not tried it. Uh, this is a citation of Donald Irving Knuth, who wants his colleague to recheck his work. Uh, there is an important idea in it that uh, you can't be sure that your program works properly and you can't be sure that how it works before you run it. Uh, it may be rephrased in many ways, like you can't be sure your product works in production before you run it in production. So we prove this on a daily basis by debugging and running tests, for example. Uh, there is one huge problem, though. Uh, by running the program, we, we check only a droplet of cases in the combinatorial ocean of possibilities. So which of those cases will backfire and which of those may break your program, we don't know. So here is another quote by Esger Ruby Dijkstra. Program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence. So there are two problems. On the one hand, we can have an ideal static analysis tool. On the other hand, by running our programs and verify them, we check only some use cases of their usage. So if you even if you have 100% formal coverage, are you really sure that you check all the branching in the libraries you use? And uh, so probably your, your code doesn't check all the branching and it is probably not annotated well by people. So does your code, code re ready for all the cases uh, re written in the libraries? So what can we do? We can run the tests. We can read the code and try to understand what does it do, uh, but then we need to know how everything works. And uh, yeah, the most powerful way is to test our programs in production. Well, it's every, everybody does that. Uh, so that's probably a bad situation. I would quit programming and do something useful, useful in my life, but well, I got a better idea. Uh, if we can't have an ultimate verification mechanism, uh, well, we can at least try to move to the more successful examples of static analysis. For example, to statically typed languages like Java and, uh, for example, IntelliJ IDEA as an analysis tool. And also, uh, we might try to improve the coverage of our tests. So we'll now try to do both. And, uh, well, I invite you to join in an intricate journey, but the end is yet to be defined. But don't worry, undefined is not a function. So, your tests may have a good coverage, but probably you don't check all the cases. For example, some very good acceptance of behavior tests that people write, uh, they don't check the subroutines directly. Uh, and uh, if they're not annotated, you may not understand fully how they work. So let's try to check and memorize more than our tests do directly. Uh, there is a, a B method of RSpec matchers. Its return type depends on what we are passing to it, uh, depending on if there is anything or not. So the two lines to the top, they actually, uh, these usages of B return different types. Uh, let's memorize the input and output types for B method as we run the tests and see what happens. So we will, running these lines, we'll get some result like 
you see on the screen. So given nothing, we'll get the B. Given integer, we'll get equal class. Uh, since the equal class doesn't have the greater operator, so probably we could achieve some result like that. Could be. Uh, yeah, there's supposed to be a demo on the next slide, but a new version of my framework came out and Gradle just couldn't download it in time. So, uh, should I press something? Does it work? Okay. So here you see that not only we can check the types, we only found where this dynamic operator is defined. So let's now discuss how this magic works. The algorithm behind this may be split into three phases. The first is to obtain the raw data from the Ruby scripts we are running. The second phase is to process the raw data into some human readable and uh, machine readable structures. And the third is to get similar results from your colleagues and share yours. I'll explain that later. So let's start with the first stage. Uh, you should probably know how to use TracePoint if, if you have uh, ever written a debugger for Ruby. Well, probably the majority of people haven't, but still, uh, well, okay, who uh, have used TracePoint at least once? Well, that's more than I expected. Well, I, I wouldn't explain its detail, uh, its API in details, but uh, there are some usages on the screen right now. Uh, you can subscribe to some events in Ruby Virtual Machine, like calling methods, returning from methods, uh, raising exceptions, and so on. And you can execute your code during these events. There you can get a binding to the local context and uh, get the values of the variables, of the parameters, and so on. Uh, you can get the method which is being called. You can get, yeah, all the variables like that, and uh, here is an interesting de detail. Uh, you can see that I'm trying to run the method foo with one parameter, but the output of this script to the bottom shows that uh, TracePoint sees both parameters to be initialized. How come? And why is it important? Let's uh, consider some abstract function foo which is defined elsewhere. It has two parameters. The first is required and the second is optional. Uh, let's imagine we have a perfect test coverage and we checked all the possible cases of running this method and we obtained two possible versions. By giving two parameters, uh, two strings, the function always returns integer and, uh, and given string and integer, it returns string. Now, as a client to that function, I would like to pass only one parameter to it. But then, how would I know what will, what will return this function if I don't know where is it defined? That's the problem. So we need to go deeper. Uh, we'll refer to another debugging possibility, the ability to disassemble the bytecode. Yet another Ruby VM is a modern uh, virtual machine from Ruby 2.0. Zero, uh, which compiles the Ruby code into a bytecode before execution. So uh, to the top you can see the bytecode for the top level function and to the bottom you see the bytecode for the method foo. Trace instructions here. Yeah, the, the output I think is quite intuitive if you are familiar with the common principles of execution on modern computers. It have a stack of frames and data stack. So uh, trace instructions here are the points where trace point may attach uh, and handle some events. And pay attention that the instructions of setting up the default parameter values of 239 to the bottom rectangle are located right before the first trace instruction. So how do we get the default uh, 
value and how do we get past it or not. Uh, look at the more top red rectangle. Uh, you, there is an argc value which is located on the instruction of calling the method foo. So in order to obtain the really past parameters, we need to find the frame from which our method was called and then find the instruction which calls our method. And there we get argc. Uh, every frame is uh, defined by rb control frame t, which is the Ruby C API structure, and it contains a pointer to the current uh, instruction and the instruction sequence itself. So, uh, yeah, the amusing thing here is that uh, during the call event of the method foo, the pointer of the caller frame uh, points towards the next instruction after our call. So in order to get argc, we actually will need to do the following. We'll need to backtrack one instruction. So our algorithm, in short, is the same. Or is the following, sorry. Uh, I'll omit the further details of this adventure since uh, some of the code looks like this and I don't see a point in explaining it. Uh, you can go to the repository and read some and I can explain something in person. Um, so, we have found the types of uh, all the incoming parameters and we have found the return types of all the calls of all the Ruby functions in our code. That's a big amount of data and we need to process it somehow. Let's consider the example of split method of the string class. The list to the left is taken from the documentation and is quite an exhaustive example of its usage. And uh, let's transform it like we did in the previous stage to the type contracts. Uh, we have no duplicates to the right, but still it's quite a big list. Can we do better? Of course we can. Uh, if my profession was to transform in type contracts in something readable, I would do something like that. Uh, well, you may read uh, like sequences, for example, in yard annotations. So it reads like that. The first parameter is nil or string or regex. The second parameter is nil or integer. And the return type of the function is always an array. Uh, well, that's a better contract. Can we automate this process? Let's transform our tuples into a diagram on how we can compute the output type for the given parameters. Uh, if we can follow the arrows given some types and uh, go somewhere, then we obtain the return type for the function. Let's merge start and end points since the, they are essentially the same. And now this is probably called an NFA, non-deterministic finite automaton, uh, which is used, well, the re regular expressions work through them, I suppose. Uh, well, let's check how it works. Uh, for example, we are given a string and nil parameters. We start at start node and uh, go in by the arrows, find the arrows with string type on them, and then try to find the arrows with nil string on them from those nodes. Well, we see one path which succeeds and we know that the return type will be an array. The second example is if we given two strings, for example, uh, we start uh, in the same manner. We find the nodes uh, by the arrows with string type, but then we can't find any arrow with the string type from these. So automaton dies in that case, and that means that we don't have uh, a data, a data example for such combination of types. So let's make our automaton a little bit more convenient. Uh, let's merge the arrows with the same types to know where to go with any given type. Uh, so the result is on the right. This is called uh, DFA, deterministic finite automaton. It's deterministic because we know every time in, in every state, if we're given a type, we know where to go or we die. 
So it's determined. And uh, the almost final step is to merge some vertices. Uh, look at the vertices in the middle. Uh, they are quite the same because uh, they have the same behavior. They accept the same set of tuples of types. So uh, speaking formally, they accept the same language. If they accept the same language, we can merge them and we obtain even a smaller automaton. And just a formal transformation later uh, will replace the node with a type inside with a just normal node without anything and an arrow with return type. So uh, in our automatons, the last, last arrow will always tell the return type of the function. So that was a good result, but there are some cases when it doesn't work. Let's consider the max function. Uh, it receives uh, two parameters of the same types and returns the third type of the same type. If we'll build similar automaton for that function, it will look like that. And that's not very good. We can't write it in short manner. Uh, well, let's do a little trick. Uh, let's introduce a special type of arrows. We'll call them reference types. Uh, they will reference to some previously passed parameters. For example, T1 will mean that it, the type is the same as the type of first parameter. After such kind of replacement, we do the same minimization as in the previous algorithm uh, procedure and obtain something like that. I've changed the function here. It just differs that uh, it returns Boolean instead of T1. So that's a good automaton to work with. There is another video which uh, shows how it works. There is an equality function we discussed and a plenty of usages to the bottom. Uh, note that there is only one usage of uh, comparing the date instances which returns true. So let's see what it will, how it will work. Will it? So we run our type tracker and then, uh, well, tonight I wrote an intention to generate a contract. So it generates something for full examples and for date we have only true class returning. Let's add the new case with false and regenerate our data. And we obtain something readable. Mostly the generation of such contracts are for demonstration purposes, though somebody can annotate their code with them to understand what happens. But mostly this is for internal use. So these were the theoretical insights. And uh, the last step is to understand what to do with all this. The first question is uh, how do we collect the data? And the second question is why should I do all this? The first is simple. Uh, in order to get the results, you need to run some Ruby scripts with uh, the type tracker. And uh, if you need to annotate your code, you run your tests and you obtain the data for, for that. But the good thing is that more general answer and the shorter one is that you just don't. You are expected to receive some results from other people so how does this work? We want to build a global library annotation network. Everyone is encouraged to share their runtime data to be merged into the global. Then the merged annotations are grouped into several packages by gem name and gem version, and then everybody can download these annotations to analyze their code. So the important thing here is that the most important things to be annotated are libraries we, we use. And we use the same libraries of different versions. And if several people, several teams use the same gem, 
they have different test cases, different test suits, and effectively, effectively they have some merged coverage of this library. And by running the tests, we receive really good coverage for the library. And these annotations may be really useful. So, yeah, that's cool, I think. Uh, and I would like to emphasize once more, uh, we improve the results of our static analysis, of our future static analysis by merging uh, our data and by merging our coverage. So speaking of static analysis, since the data we're talking about uh, can be obtained uh, and shared by anybody, uh, I would like to ask you to think what, uh, how can you apply this? Maybe you wanted to write a plugin for Veeam, and, but you couldn't write the resolving mecha mechanism. That is the fundamentals we want to provide to everybody to improve the tools they use and make the Ruby's life better. Uh, there are several ways to help this project evolve. Uh, there are some scientific challenges of the type system, of working with singleton classes and side effects and stuff. Uh, there are numerous possibilities to use the data in your everyday tools and improve them. And uh, if you don't want to run anything or don't want to write anything, you, want, you may just run your code with a type tracker and uh, give the coverage of your test suite to everybody and improve the code completion, for example, of the person you don't even know. Uh, there is a link to the repo uh, of, our, of our project. It's not ready, it's fragile, it doesn't even have README because I pushed it to GitHub two days ago. But uh, I think in four weeks or so, we'll have some working API for running the tests, for sharing and downloading the data. If we succeed, will solve some of the problems which probably lead people away from the dynamic languages, and Ruby in particular. Uh, well, as I said in the very beginning, the major part of the programmer's success is the tool set they use. So the developer happiness is not only about the language, it's also about the tools. That's it, thank you. Hey, thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, hi. Uh, so, like on every conference, Mats is promising us Ruby free, like, and when it's, it, it will be ready when it's ready. But one feature he mentions always is optional types. So, how is this uh, library in line, or at least consulted with uh, Ruby contributors? Well, it wasn't consulted yet, but as far as I understood, we won't get gradual typing in Ruby 3. But even if we we'll have some, uh, receive some annotations, uh, support in Ruby, we still need to generate them somehow. And this project may help uh, transform the existing projects into some annotated and gradual type ones. But as far as I understood, as far as I read, and uh, listened to, uh, it won't work. Any other question? So what about the case when a library can be called with an infinite number of classes, like in terms of general Ruby community? Um, because it, um, it uses conversions, like it calls to us, and it basically, um, um, it expects an interface that this is something convertible to string, but it can be string, it can be symbol, it can be number, and so at the end, if we gather all the results, we would find out like a distribution of classes, like some part of community like passes string, some passes symbols, but a few people pass their own class only from their own project. Like, do you plan to handle it somehow? Yeah, this may be tackled. Uh we, we didn't, didn't tackle this yet, but there are two approaches. Uh, the first is uh, when we see a large number of different classes, we can just replace it with an asterisk 
wildcard or replace it with a super class. And the second approach, the more correct from the Ruby point of view is to use duck typing. So if we see that all the classes have the same method and it is called, probably it deserves duck typing. So then we would be like dynamically detecting interfaces. Yeah, we, we have all, all, all this data on runtime and since we're collecting the data in runtime, we can do this. Cool, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so thanks you once again. Thank you.